Father God, as we come before you this morning, we pray for open hearts and minds. We pray, Lord God, for your word, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. Great book, Hebrews. A sort of pep talk, isn't it? An affirmation of the superiority of Jesus. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than Melchizedek. He's the greater covenant. He's greater than all the old ways. And as one of the old writers of many years ago once put it, the book of Hebrews was written by a Hebrew to other Hebrews, telling Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. <laughs> in other words, to stop slipping back in their old ways, the rituals of Judaism. And the letter really is an exhortation to continue in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name, of course, we've gathered this morning. And what better way to continue in our lives? Today, we speak of the uniqueness and the efficacy of Jesus in our day-to-day -day lives. And we speak of blood. Not any blood, but nothing but the blood of Jesus. Some of you may remember that song. Can I have a show of hands so we know what we're going to do later on? Yes. We have a show. Where's Wayne? I hope you got that, Wayne. As the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, once said, pick up the scriptures and run to the cross. Never was a man blamed in heaven for preaching Christ too much. And we're going to be preaching the blood of Christ today. And over the past few weeks, since Christmas, in fact, we've been looking at many new things. We've looked at new birth. We've looked at a new beginning. We've looked at new heart. And last week, the work of the Mount Moriah Trust bringing... Uh, trust and hope into different areas. And the reality today is the new covenant, the new and improved covenant, the covenant improved by the shedding of blood. Not any blood, but nothing but the blood of Jesus. The new covenant, which we was mentioned just now, the word diakathe, really means a testament or a will. And it only comes valid when the person making the testament or will dies. The testament or will, as we all know, just outlines the desires of the person who's actually making the will and what should happen to the goods and chattels, people who will benefit from the death of the person concerned. Purely as a matter of interest, the word covenant, or the words meaning covenant, appear 280 times for those statisticians amongst us in the Old Testament, and 33 times in the New Testament. And if you like, I'll give you time, you can count them. But it gives some idea of the importance of the testament. It gives the importance of the will. And what is the will of God? What is his will? It's that we have a relationship with him. That we have that wonderful relationship with a glorious and a grace-filled God. But what stops us? The stain of sin. The stain of sin gets in the way of our relationship with a great and a glorious God. From the beginning of time, right from the very start, the Lord God when he created his most perfect creation, us. Right from the very beginning, he wanted to have a loving and a personal relationship with mankind. But we knew better. We decided to do the thing he didn't want us to do. Some of you may have seen a, a meme doing the rounds on doing the thing. God said, don't do the thing, and the people did the thing. And we were separated. From God, But being a loving God right from the beginning, God put in place various procedures by which we could re-enter that personal relationship with him, that we could get back to our relationship with God. A means by which the barrier which separates him from us, or should more correctly, us from him, could be removed. 
It's a very sad fact, unfortunately, that since the beginning of time, right up to this present age, there is a concept that God winks at sin. Oh, it's only a minor thing. You'll be right. But it's simply not true. It's preached in many places in the world, in many churches, that so long as you're a good person, you're okay. God does not wink at sin. As we're reminded in Habakkuk, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You can tolerate no wrong. What Habakkuk is actually saying is that God is too holy and pure to look at sin, to even tolerate sin, to be anywhere near sin. And God will judge all sin, past and present. But he will do it in his time, and he will do it in his way. All sin must be paid for, no matter how small, no matter how large. For the unbeliever, regrettably, for the atheist, for those sneerers and mockers, there is only one solution. That's a condemnation and an unpopular word in churches these days, hell. But for the believer, for those accepting the grace of the living God. Sin is paid for at the cross. Our sin is paid for. Our sin will be paid for. Our sin will be purged and cleansed. God loves us no matter what we've been through, what we've done, how we've become soiled, how grubby we are. I had an illustration written down here about the lady who went to a garage sale and found a copper teapot which was grimy and dented. But while I was sitting there just now, I was reminded some time ago, chatting to a friend of ours who had been rummaging around on the floor of a hut. And in amongst the pebbles and the rock muck and the, the, the soil and, the, and the, the clay had seen something she thought was a stone. And she chiseled it out, and it turned out to be a glob of clay around something. So she took it home, cleaned it, washed it, and it turned out to be a beautiful diamond ring. And I remember at the time thinking, what a great illustration as to who we are, grubby in a morass of filth. But we hold value. We still hold value. Regardless of the condition we're in, we can be cleaned up. We are valuable to God. And the Bible reminds us that we are stained in sin and the guilt and the shame of our past behavior takes away our value, appears to take away our value. We're reminded in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes, we have all sinned. We have all done wrong. We have all offended our God. And that creates a problem for us because, as I said earlier, Habakkuk has reminded us that God is too pure to look on anything that's sinful and soiled. But the Bible also tells us that God loves us so much that he offered a, a way that we can wash away our sin, a way to cleanse ourselves so that we may regain the value that he has in us, that copper pot or that diamond ring extracted from the mire. And it's intriguing that the method he chose to clean us up doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But we have it here in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, which was read by Helen just now. Here we see that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Blood sacrifice have happened since the beginning of time throughout the Old Testament. And here in Hebrews, we find that the blood of Jesus is the only thing that will purify us. What is there about the blood that can be a cleaning agent? Blood is one of the most difficult stains to get out of clothes, as we're told in the various adverts. Any number of laundry adverts which we're bombarded with on television buy new Omo and Tide gets the dirt out. 
Do you remember Big Kev? Goes back a bit. He used to have a whole lot of cleaning things. He used to stand there and say, I am excited. And it would remove the grease from pots and pans. It would take the spots off your dog. There's some wonderful jingles as well. Ajax. Do you remember Ajax? Ajax, bomb, bomb. You foaming cleanser, bomb, bomb. I should get a job in advertising. Not in <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. But have you noticed when you look at these adverts of the, 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 the efficacious sprays and tin cans and stuff, there's always a new and improved formula. Have you noticed? Yeah, you buy one today and you think, whoa, I've got the best. And then the following day, there's a new improved formula. So you've got to throw that one away and get the new improved formula. However, the Bible tells us that the most powerful cleansing agent in the world is blood. God's plan for salvation in the early days of those priestly codes insisted that one day a year there was a ritual cleaning, a bit like a roadworthy. You used to have to go along once a year to be cleansed. Everything was cleansed. Everything was cleansed on the Day of Atonement. And interestingly enough, when we start looking at the early days and the rituals that were undertaken, and we chat to people in the world today, so many mock the fact that blood is used as a cleaning agent. And I suppose if you think about it, the mockers and the atheists, they do have a point. How can blood remove grime and dirt when blood itself is a stain-producing agent that can ruin virtually anything it comes into contact with? You just have to ask my wife about the specks of blood that I leave lying around the place. Is that not true? <laughs> but the irony is, and it is an irony, that God did create blood as the ultimate cleaning agent. In our body, blood gets pumped around through the veins and venules and capillaries, etc. And what does it do? It takes oxygen to the cells, but it also removes all the impurities and the toxins and the bad things. Blood literally does clean out the dirt and the toxins from our body. And that's its major function. Blood gives and sustains life. There is no other cleaning agent known to man that can purify our body system so well as the blood that courses through our veins. And the new improved formula. Wait, there's more to come. Because it doesn't just keep our bodies going by removing all the toxins and things. It's also one of the most powerful cleaning agents known to man because it can rid our souls of the filth and the shame that the blood of Jesus removes from each one of us. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Blood was designed by God to be used to forgive you and me of our sins. Which blood? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This blood cleanses the internal and the external, the physical, the spiritual. The blood heals, it rejuvenates, it replenishes, it gives life. This blood can heal the sick, heal the blind, and it can take you to the very throne of God. And God uses blood for various reasons. Firstly, blood is life. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, we read, For the life of a creature is in its blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. In other words, God intended for blood to take away sin because life is in the blood. The blood also teaches us, the Bible also teaches us that sin brings death. We're reminded in Romans, the wages of sin is death. But God desires to give us life and hence 
blood is being identified with life is the most natural substance for blood for God to use to bring us that life. The old chorus which I've been alluding to since I started, nothing but the blood of Jesus, used to be sung differently, which we're going to try at the end of this talk. It used to be sung, instead of all together, where the leader would say, what can wash away my sin? And the response was, nothing but the blood of Jesus. We'll try that later on. It's the blood of Jesus that saves us. It doesn't matter that we belong to a church because it's the blood of Christ that brings forgiveness, not memberships to any particular society, any particular church, any particular congregation. Many people say, look, I've been baptized. Well, that's good. That's wonderful. But God isn't looking for water. He's looking for blood. Many people say, look, I devoutly give to the church every week. I have an icon on the wall which I talk to. I have a rosary. It doesn't matter what you've got. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you meet with. God is not looking for your position in a church. He's looking for blood. Some say, look, I'll tell you all the good things that I've done. I'm working my way to heaven. I w there was a thing on television the other day. A gentleman was talking about going to heaven, and he wanted to know what he had to do, and he was talking to a nun. And she said, well, it's a little bit like climbing a ladder. You do a couple of good things, you go up two rungs. You do a bad thing, you come down a rung. No. It's nothing to do with what you do and what you don't do. God is looking for blood. He's not looking for works. He's not looking for water. He's looking for blood. He's looking for the blood of Jesus. As we look at our reading today, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 12. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things, that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter the tabernacle by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all in his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus shed his own blood, not the blood of calves, not the blood of goats. He shed his own blood to obtain eternal redemption. Our sins had to be paid for, and the high priest entered the Holy of Holies and the presence of God through the blood of goats and calves. But that was temporary. That was a once-a-year thing, a bit like our car roadworthy. However, Jesus secured redemption once and for all through his own perfect sacrifice of himself by his own blood, not the blood of anything else, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Verses 13 to 14, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonial and unclean sanctify them so that they can be outwardly clean. It covers them up. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse not just our outer selves, but cleanse our consciousness of acts that lead to death, in other words, sin, so that we may serve who? The living God. Jesus shed his blood by choice. He offered himself unblemished to God. There was a choice that involved the death of Christ. He offered himself, he shed his blood freely for us. The animal sacrifices never had a choice whether they were going to live or whether they were going to die. They didn't even know what was happening. They simply died under the compulsion of the law. They died because the law said they had to die. They had no willingness. Men who sacrificed these animals knew that it was a ritual, they were obeying the rules. But the animals had no choice. They were forced to be sacrificed, they were forced to die. 
Jesus knew what he was doing. He chose to give his life for us. No man took it from him. It was a rational choice. Jesus was the perfect God, the perfect man. He had perfect wisdom and perfect understanding. Jesus chose to die. He knew why there must be blood sacrifice, even though the men who put him to death didn't know what they were doing. Jesus knew what he was doing. He died by choice for us. Verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant, in the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when someone has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. Jesus shed his blood and died. Therefore, that covenant, that will, comes into force. As we read in this passage, we're aware of the fact of death. In fact, for us, this, the experience of redemption, there must be an end to physical life. Shedding of blood is the result of the penalty of sin, and the wages of sin are death. The shedding of blood, the result of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, God slaughtered an animal to clothe them, to cover their sin. When Adam and Eve, if you remember rebelled against God, they were aware of their sin, their nakedness, their frailty. And God slaughtered an animal to cover them with the skin. There, in the presence of God, they saw the animal sacrificed that gave up its life for their sin. When the blood had gone, the animal had died. Its blood was shed as a payment for their sin. And that's what Jesus did for us. He died. Verse 18. This is why even the first covenant has not been put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. And he said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled the blood on the tabernacle and everything used in ceremonies. Jesus shed his blood to put the new covenant into effect. And it's interesting to note when we run through the procedure by which Moses cleansed the tabernacle there. First of all, the blood was sprinkled on the scriptures, on the, on the scroll on every page of the book. And we praise God for the blood in this book. Every page in this book bleeds and points us to the cross. It's a book sprinkled with the blood of redemption. It's a story from the beginning of time right through to the cross. It's the story of the sacrificial blood sprinkled on the book that we read. The blood was also sprinkled on the tabernacle and all the vessels of worship. And when we come to worship here in this small church, we don't come to sing to perfect musicians and perfect singers, well, near perfect singers. We don't come to hear perfect preachers. We don't come to hear perfect teachers. Every one of us has a sinful nature, but praise God, the vessels of ministry, all the vessels, you, we are all vessels of God. We've all been sprinkled with the blood and have been touched by the blood of Jesus. When we sing, when we preach, when we teach, when we share together, we do so because God washes over us with his blood. He purified us, he sanctified us, the Spirit of God washes away our imperfections. God uses imperfect vessels. And my goodness me, when I look in the mirror, I sometimes think, there's a cracked pot. Or 
an unworthy vessel. But God uses each one of us. God sprinkles each one of us. All of his people, verse 19. As recipients of God's provision, we receive the symbolic covering of shed blood. The blood sprinkled on the book, the blood sprinkled on the ministry, the blood sprinkled on the people. That's good news. It was then and it still is now. Why? We've already had that in verse 22. The fact that the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood because without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Jesus shed his blood for each one of us for the forgiveness of sins. And our text goes on to say that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin. And that's the goal of the blood. That's the purpose for which Jesus died. He died to provide forgiveness as a penalty for our sin and so provide freedom for each one of us. And so, in conclusion, what can wash away our sin? What can make me whole again? Do you want to try and sing that? What can wash away my sin?